Thank you that we get this opportunity to celebrate, to proclaim and remember your son's death. We take a cracker that represents your son's body and we take a cup of juice that represents his blood, his body that was given and his blood that was shed for us, for believers. We get a chance right now to do that, to remember that. I pray that this would just make much of you and glorify your son. And it's in his great name we pray, amen. As we spend time in God's word, we want to make sure that everybody actually has a copy of God's word in their hands. So if you don't have a copy, the men are going to pass out Bibles. So go ahead and just raise your hand and the men will make sure a copy of God's word is sitting in your hands. And as they do so, please open your Bibles to Luke chapter 18. We're going to be in verses 9 through 14 this morning. Luke chapter 18 verses 9 through 14. I want to ask a few questions. Do you believe in God? Do you pray? Do you believe in the authority of the Bible? Do you read the Bible? Do you think you know what God expects? Do you think you do a pretty good job carrying out what he expects? Do you think... It's because of these things you should go to heaven. Please follow along as I read Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. And he, Jesus, also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Verse 9 tells us that Jesus was addressing this parable to people that trusted in themselves that they were righteous. These people were convinced that they were good people. They were confident that They were righteous that they had met or even exceeded God's standard for what is right, for what is required, for what is good. So Jesus tells them a parable, a story, and proceeds to teach them a shocking truth that's going to turn their world upside down. Look at verse 10. Two men went into into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisees were a religious sect within Judaism that practiced a strict observance of Mosaic law. They were seen by the people as righteous, moral, and good. And this Pharisee likely would have had the entire Old Testament memorized. He believed in God and he even prayed. The Jewish tax collector, on the other hand, would have been one of the most hated and despised men in Israel. He was a Jew who collected taxes on behalf of Rome. He was seen as a traitor to the Jewish people. They were often characterized by greed and corruption. And Jewish tax collectors served as the model for sinners that were beyond salvation. They were ceremonially ceremonially unclean and excluded from religious activities. These two men could not have been more different. And yet... They're both going into the temple to pray. Look at verses 11 and 12. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. This Pharisee is telling God how good he is. He's providing his self-confident assessment 
of what he has done. He states that he is not like all these immoral people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Not only that, he states how he even went beyond what the law requires. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. He's saying, not only do I fast on the day of atonement as the law requires, I fast twice a week. God, look at me. Isn't that impressive? And in verse 13, the tax collector provides a striking contrast to the Pharisee. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven. The tax collector recognized his unworthiness, his sinfulness. He stood far off, and his posture, he hung his head in shame. He could not even lift his eyes to heaven. And verse 13 continues, and he was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. He emphatically begs God to be merciful. And that word for mercy here is not simply showing mercy. That's a different word. But this word has to do with propitiation. Be propitiated towards me. Turn your wrath away from me. This tax collector recognizes himself as the sinner. He recognizes himself as one who rightly deserves God's wrath. He knows that when compared to God's righteous, holy standard, he falls short and he has earned God's punishment and begs God to do the atoning work and to forgive his sins. And in verse 14, Jesus turns the theological world upside down when he says, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went to his house justified rather than the other, rather than the Pharisee. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus says that the tax collector, the despised of society, was justified, was declared righteous before God rather than than the Pharisee. The tax collector has been acquitted. His sins have been forgiven. How can this be? How can such a sinner be declared righteous? The tax collector, recognizing his sinfulness, humbly petitions the only one that can actually do anything about his sin. He puts all his confidence and trust in God to do the salvation work. The Pharisee puts his confidence and trust in himself. Romans chapter 3 tells us there is none righteous, not even one. Both of these men provided a self-assessment. The Pharisee thought wrongly that he was righteous. And the tax collector knew rightly that he was was wicked. The prevailing theology of salvation then and even today is that good people go to heaven. Those that are good, moral, spiritual, religious, they can achieve a right relationship with God. However, God will not set, accept man's righteousness. He will only accept his son's righteousness. Jesus was the only one that perfectly fulfilled God's holy law. He's the only one that can satisfy the wrath of God. He went to the cross to stand in place of sinners to bear their penalty for sins. Jesus gets their sin and they, believers, get Jesus's righteousness. And therefore, they can be declared righteous in God's courtroom. That propitiation, that wrath-satisfying sacrifice is only available to those that have humbled themselves and are putting all their confidence and trust solely in the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross. If you're here today and you don't believe what I've just been talking about, if you're not putting your trust and confidence in Christ alone, then we ask that when these elements come by that you would simply just pass the tray. This is a, a family time to remember Jesus and to proclaim what he has done on the cross. We're glad that you're here. We're glad, we're glad that you get to hear these truths. But right now, 
You're trusting in something other than Christ alone. And that has eternal consequences. Please talk to me or any of the other pastors or perhaps the person that brought you. We would love to talk to you about what Jesus' righteousness accomplishes. Believer, remember God's saving work in your life. Remember where your only hope is actually found. Remember Jesus on the cross and his atoning work and what it accomplished for you. And when your hearts are prepared, please go ahead and take communion on your own, and I will come back up and close our time in prayer.